There are lots of ways to capture moments in our lives, from journaling about our experiences to writing letters or emails, taking photos, videos, and even posting on social media. So today, we're looking at ways people in central Ohio have captured moments in time. In our first story, we take a look at the history of the Columbus Call and Post, a newspaper that served the African-American community from 1962 to 1995. The newspaper's photo archives are stored at the King Arts Complex, and they give us a view of what life was like in the black community during that time. Post actually started in Cleveland, Ohio, but from Columbus it also spread to Cincinnati and many other cities here in Ohio. There were locations in Dayton, Akron, Youngstown, Sandusky, Toledo. There were at least nine different locations for the Column Post. They actually opened the offices in May of 1962 at 1102 East Long Street. Amos Lynch, he was deeply rooted in the community and he always made sure he spoke of positive influences in this community, such as East High School, so many great academics and athletics that they took place there. Mr. Lynch was heavily committed to sharing the positivity of this community, didn't want to talk about a lot of the negative plight and things that were going on. He wanted to shed light on the greatness of the Near East Side and all African Americans here in Central Ohio. What we have here is the what we would call the photo morgue for the Columbus Column Post. So these are uh, as far as we know, all of the images from the newspaper starting as far back as 1962 and up through 1995. So we have years of amazing images of the community and for a decade that we don't have a record of the newspaper. We do not have microfilm or physical copies of the Columbus Column Post for 1962 through 1972. No one does. So these photos are all we have left of that time period. The process is where the partner of the King Arts Complex to help them digitize these wonderful photos and get them online. So we'll come over and we'll pick up a batch of photos and they actually are in these envelopes still uh, as they were from uh, when they were used for the newspaper. And so we'll actually still see them in the, the envelope. They've got the date on the side and we'll just pick up a whole drawer of these and take them back to the library. And we're not only helping to digitize them and get them online so more people have access to them, but also get them in acid-free folders so that we can help preserve them for the future. Oh, so, oh, this one actually has an issue of the newspaper okay. in it as well. So lucky. What date is that newspaper? This newspaper is Saturday, March 27th, 1976. This might oh, wow. actually be it's from Anna. the set of Affirmation. It's and Anna, Anna Bishop. Bishop and Marianne Williams. This is history. <laughs> First time seen since 1976. It's oh, and Kojo. Kojo took this it. This is a Kojo photo. This is a Kojo Kamau photo of his wife, Marianne, Dr. Marianne Williams and Anna Bishop. Some of the earlier ones, there was actually a stamp on the back of the photo, uh, but these actually have the tags taped onto them and they tell us the basically the small caption for the photo and then tells us the size of the original, what section and page of the newspaper it would be on, and then the date for the, the newspaper that it would have been printed in. Kojuk Mao is a fantastic Columbus photographer and he and his wife, Dr. Marianne Williams, started ACE, Art for Community Expression, and they also uh, started the Afro Fair. They did so much for the black community. ACE was integral to making sure that black artists were able to get their work out and sell their work and get recognition for what they've done uh, when other galleries were not willing to show black art. Curtsy practice, Hurley at East, Miss Corinthian pageant. Archie Griffin's graduation photo. Oh my gosh. From The Ohio State University. What a treasure. Every time you open up an envelope from the Columbus Column Post, there's just so many amazing gems. And look you at this. Recognize how many people, oh, Go yes. to the next one. So you, you can see, see. This is the image. photo to newspaper. 
And you can actually see the marks on many of the photos to show how they were going to crop it and how it would end up looking in the newspaper. For years, you know, no one's had the opportunity to fully go through each photo. So we're so happy to have the opportunity to do so now. And again, we don't have the newspapers for the first decade of the Columbus Column Post. So the library is also looking for any help that people have with identifying who people are in some of these photos. Because again, most of the time, all we have is the information that are on these tags here, which often don't name the people in the photograph. And this was actually when some officers were being installed for the Mount Vernon District uh, Improvement Association. And right here in front, we have Edna L. Bryce, and she was a florist in uh, the community for decades. And she was integral to getting the Mount Vernon uh, area the way that it was, and the, the thriving business community that it was. She was a part of the Small Business uh, Association as well, and she was on their advisory council at one point. She's an amazing community leader, and we see her here with other officers being installed uh, for the 1970 Mount Vernon Improvement Association. We also have this one here, which is actually the Tribbett Building. And what I thought was really interesting about this is you can see the office for uh, Pierce and Son Florist and Photo Studio, which is one of, I, I would say, probably the most prominent uh, photographer for the Columbus Column Post. So, so many of these photos will have a Pierce and Son stamp on them. And then we've also got this great parade photo. So this was an, an Elks parade. And you can see this is on East Main Street, uh, close to, I think, Miller Avenue and Main. And you can see several businesses here, uh, Flossie's Shrimp House, which I, I believe was at 1432 East Main Street. Those were iconic landmarks, but these are forgotten stores, forgotten restaurants, and the photos allowed them to live on forever. These photographs are ones that we've already digitized, so we've uh, changed them over from those envelopes to these acid-free folders. And yes, with each photo, especially with this one where we have businesses clearly uh, shown in the photo, we will do a research in the Columbus Column Post because it is fully online and searchable. And then we will also use city directories and other resources to help us learn what uh, businesses these are, how long they were there, and give us more information. We actually have over 4,000 images already digitized and online for the King Arts Complex uh, collection. And this one here is special to me. It was one of the first ones that we found and had a celebrity in it. It has Muhammad Ali, and we can see him here in the back of the photo, and he's taking just a group picture with local kids in the area. It's actually from uh, September, late September, early October of 1968, and we know that this is when uh, Muhammad Ali was being accused of draft dodging, and he was actually in Columbus because he was supposed to have a boxing exposition, but the Columbus Boxing and Wrestling Commission actually denied him the permit he needed to box here, and Mayor Sensenbrenner said that they do not want someone who is a draft dodger here in Columbus. And so we can see the juxtaposition of him being here and spending time with the community and the kids and taking this photo with them and that appearing in the Columbus Column Post versus what was happening around this time and the coverage that we were seeing. While there's still a, a version of the Column Post being published now digitally, uh, the version that Amos Lynch was really involved in kind of uh, came to a, a head at 1995 is when Amos Lynch left the Column Post and started his new newspaper, The Columbus Post. I would say Amos Lynch was a visionary. Uh, for him to bestow upon the King Arts Complex to have all of the photos that we have to display um, is just the beauty of him making sure that the history lives on forever. Because the photos, even though people in the community were going through some tough times, you see a lot of love, you see a lot of happiness, you see a lot of community togetherness, in which is more needed today more than ever. Diaries are another common way that we capture memorable moments. They're written for personal use, but they can sometimes reveal a more in-depth point of view than our history books. That is the case in this next story, when a diary, along with a collection of photos, was discovered by a descendant of the Cells Circus. The entries shed light on an important time in the circus's history that had not been well documented. 
until now. The Columbus Metropolitan Library was granted access to the collection and we head over there now to learn more. Hi Don, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. So can you tell me a little bit about this collection and how you obtained it? Okay, uh, the collection that uh, I, I have transferred uh, basically includes a lot of uh, material that I had inherited from my stepmother. I think the best way to start is the picture of the lady over my left shoulder, I think you can see it there, is a, a picture that uh, we have inherited and it is of uh, Alice Sells. She was born in 1870 and died in 1890 during childbirth. Although she died during childbirth, the child survived, and that child was named Hester, and she was the mother of my stepmother, Hester Moyer, who is the person who gave me the collection here that uh, includes a, a lot of material about the Sells brothers. I knew from my stepmother, Hester, that she had a connection to the Sells brothers' family and to the circus. And she often used to talk about it. And I thought, well, I'll look into it and see what's available uh, and then try to find a good home for the various pieces of it. Can you actually tell me a little bit about what you sent to us? Uh, what I sent was several boxes of uh, material. Uh, it includes some photo albums. Uh, one photo album was of the Sells Brothers. There are a bunch of loose photographs in there as well. And the material that I think was of most interest to this discussion included material that was related to the, uh, the Sells Brothers circus trip in 1891 and through 92 to Australia. And that material included uh, a route book. It included um, material that was in a form of a diary. Uh, there were three diaries. And that is the material I think that uh, is most uh, significant because these are firsthand uh, de descriptions of what it was like uh, picking up, leaving Columbus, Ohio in the middle of the afternoon on a train that took her out, uh, and took everyone out to uh, California. They caught a steamer and, it, and then the steamship went all the way down to Australia. Uh, and um, I believe it carried, uh, you know, the whole family and all of the circus troupe too. So Don, uh, what, what would you like to get out of this collection? What else would you like to know about the collection? Uh, what I'm looking forward to is to seeing the material that I have in a larger context uh, of uh, the, the whole Sells Brothers operation and get a better uh, understanding of uh, what it must have been like to organize a, a circus and then take it all the way across the country, including the animals. To me, it's just uh, amazing to think about uh, how uh, much fortitude they had to be able to do all of this uh, more than 130 years ago. That'd be great. We're going to do more research on it, and then we'll fill you in on what we find. Great. Great. Thank you. Wow, Aaron, this is a cool donation. What, what do you have here? This is a Sells family collection that um, Don Snyder donated to us. The first thing that he donated to us were the Sells Brothers route book that was taken in Australia in 1891 and 1892. The thing I love about the actual route book that they produced is it has a mini schedule at the very beginning. There's this first thing that I opened up is I noticed that there was an insert, Australian tour, and it tells you what, what city they were in and how long they were there. That's amazing. Which is really cool. And then as I started leafing through it, I realized that not only was there information about how each of their shows went and how their travel was, but also information about all the performers that were in the circus. So your acrobats, your clowns, your um, daredevils. Spread throughout the book, there are advertisements about the different acts um, that were a part of that particular season. Yeah. So what would it have been like to travel from Columbus, Ohio with the circus to Australia? Yeah, so the other interesting thing that we got that Don sent uh, to us first was this diary that Nellie Thorpe wrote. Okay. And Nellie Thorpe was... That name sounds familiar. 
Nellie Siebert Thorpe. This is her when she's uh, probably in her 20s. Nellie Thorpe was married to a man named Henry Thorpe, okay. who was the secretary and treasurer of the Sells Brothers Circus. Uh, they left September 3rd, 1891, and they get New South Wales in uh, November 19th, 1891. So, yeah, two months. Wow. Two months they get there through train and, and, and boat. So, what's interesting about these is they start in um, the United States, um, and the most interesting parts are the trips into California, actually. When they're in California, she mentions visiting San Francisco. And one of the strange things is that one of the tour guides takes her through the, the mean streets of San Francisco in the 1890s, <laughs> and they end up in an opium den. And she describes this opium den in great detail wow. about the smell. And it's really interesting to hear this kind of socialite from Columbus go into the mean streets of San Francisco and describe her, her experiences there. <laughs> The other cool things of, um, that I, f I find interesting are when she's on the ship, she talks about rough sea, she's talking about um, landing at different ports and islands. She talks about landing in Hawaii and meet meeting the queen at the time. You can imagine shipping a gigantic circus across the country. It's quite expensive, so just hearing about the animals on the ship and how uh, rough it was for them and how sick they got as well. So Aaron, can, can you tell us more about the tour? How many stops did they do in Australia? They stopped at about 50 different locations. Wow. And every time they had to pull up stakes and reset up. Um, a lot of the diaries talk about that as how much is involved in that. So um, a lot of it is talking about um, how some of these used to be big towns. And when they get there, they're old mining towns that are like are, are empty now. So the showing's not great because it used to be 25,000 people and now there's only 3,000 people in the town. So the interesting thing too about these diaries is that they're very matter of fact. So I give you an instance where she's just talking about, you know, she's window shopping in Sydney, but she's also talking about, oh, one of the horses got frightened when the elephants passed by and one of them literally dropped dead of fright. And it just acts like it's a normal thing that elephants are like a part of your everyday life and that horses are dropping dead and, you know, rattlesnakes are biting the tall men. <laughs> Um, in the desert and um, just, it's very strange, this dichotomy between normal life and then the circus life, and she just acts like it's a normal thing. I also found it interesting, and they decided to go to Australia when it's the hottest part of the year. So oh, no. our winter being their summer, so they're there in November and December, and she always talks about it's so hot, it's so dry. It seems like there's always uh, a heat wave that they're dealing with. You can definitely tell this person has money, they're from the upper class but it doesn't sound like a particularly easy trip. What's the photo album up here? Are these pictures of the actual performers? Yes, yeah, so I think this is Don's side of the family, the Moyers, but I think there's some acrobats in his family as well. Yeah. So I saw here there's acrobats. And then this is mainly the Sells Brothers family here, and most of these people okay. are Columbus residents. So these are really family photo albums that also capture the business that the family was in. Yeah. The photos really bring the diary to life and even vice versa, really. The uh, great thing about this collection is we can use the route book, the information that's provided in here. Mm -hmm. We can use it in tandem with these photographs and identify who these people are. Which is so cool because it's unusual to be able to have this number of photographs all together, but then be able to have a, a way to try to identify them. Just a great um, collection of things that are sort of cross-referenced yeah. from one another. Wow, Erin, this is so cool that this um, came to the Columbus Metropolitan Library and will be part of the collection. How will people be able to see this? So what we'll be doing is scanning it and um, doing research on it to get it available online. It'll be on our My History website, which is columbuslibrary.org slash myhistory, where we have over a million items already and we'll keep adding to it. The Sells Brothers is an important part of our history, so we'll keep adding to that Sells Brothers history with these new photographs. It always amazes me the things that people have in their homes and their attics and their basements and eventually they will donate to the library and I just love that we're able to bring all this together 
and make it available for people to see here at the library. Yeah, I agree, and I think the interesting part about this is just when you think all the old stuff is, you know, already been donated or given or destroyed in some cases, that, you know, you still find photo albums with ten types in them from 150 years ago. Well, thank you for sharing this, Aaron. Thank you for saving it and getting it all digitized and, and saving this story for Columbus. Thank you. It's often said that a picture is worth a thousand words. That may be true in some cases, but at times we need someone, or in this next segment, a historian, to give a picture context. With that idea in mind, we teamed up with the Columbus Metropolitan Library to examine a photo from their collection and share the story behind this snapshot in time. This is a photo of the State House, obviously, um, taken in 1988 by city photographer David Lucas. You can see that the State House grounds look a little different. Um, the trees are much smaller. Today we think of the State House, we have this nice tree-lined area. They built the underground parking garage in 1964. To do that, they had to you know, remove all the trees. So th these are gonna be much younger than you know, what we see today. If you look at the buildings around Capitol Square, um, to our left here, we've got Trinity Episcopal Church, which is still there, um, the Galleria building still there today, the Columbus Dispatch, which is the um, Chamber of Commerce now. Um, next to that, you're looking at the University Club, which is no longer there today. The University Club was there from 1931 to 1994 and is um, a parking lot today. Next to that, you have the Central Ohio Savings and Loan, which is that very um, Greek Revival looking bank building. Um, it was built in 1955. It looks much older because the Greek Revival style wasn't really something they were doing a lot of in 1955, um, but they did here anyway. On the corner there, you've got the Bricker and Eckler building, which is the old post office and courthouse. Turning the corner, the Sheridan building, and then um, Capitol Square, the Ohio Theater, um, all of those are there today. Then you have the Beggs Building, built in 1928. These kind of two buildings on the corner here um, are no longer there today, the Beggs Building and the Baker Art Gallery. The Baker Art Gallery building by this time, I believe was a shoe store, um, but it had existed for a much, much longer, um, from 1892 to 1988, um, as the Baker, well, the building was there until 1988, as the Baker Art Gallery. Here's a street view photo of what that would have looked like. The Baker Art Gallery is one of the most prominent photography companies in Columbus, um, really throughout the 19th and 20th century. Um, we see so many of the photographs that come into the library or that other institutions have in their collections do belong to Baker, and it held a position there for a long time right at the corner of um, State and High. WOSU's Curious Sea Bus answers your questions about our region, its history, and its people. Today's question takes us just south of Bexley to Columbus's Berwick neighborhood. The area has strong ties to the city's Jewish and African-American communities, and it's known for its large ranch-style homes and big backyards. Decades ago, as the land transitioned to a residential area, there was a period of time when it was home to nine irons and sand traps. That led one curious resident to ask us, where exactly was the Berwick Golf Course and when did it operate? Using today's streets as a guide, the Berwick Golf Course roughly bordered College Avenue on the east and James Road on the west, and ran from Berwick Boulevard south to Scottwood Road. Before the land was developed, it was known as Ambos Park, a spot left wild by its owner as a nature preserve with lakes for fishing. By the spring of 1932, the Columbus Sunday Dispatch reported that, despite the economic depression, the Berwick Construction Company was going ahead with plans to further develop a new subdivision with homes and a golf course. The company placed ads in the paper touting brick homes adjacent to a new golf course under construction. One article reported that the course would even include a modern watering system for the greens. That summer, the golf course was open, and a year later, construction of the clubhouse was completed. 
A golf course operated for over two decades. Then, in 1955, it was announced that the east section of the course would be replaced by 145 ranch-style homes, with plans to develop the rest of the land by the end of that year. The price for a new Berwick home in 1955? Just a little over 20 grand. Do you have a question for Curious Seabus? Head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Just some other weekend night.